I'm really excited to be here today. I would just like to say sorry to the nice live captioning person because I didn't send my slides beforehand. So I hope that I speak clearly today. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a topic that is really close to my heart, um, which is the personal website. Um, so, cool, that's gone to sleep. Yeah, my name is Sophie. I'm the web engineering lead at Monzo in London. Um, and I have my own website, localghost.dev. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter, type underscore underscore error. But my main goal being here today is to get you to build your own website. And I don't mean the one that everyone has with the sections and the calls to action and the feature grids, sorry, Lex, but they serve a purpose, right? But I'm talking about a space that is entirely yours, a reflection of your personality in HTML and CSS and a little tiny bit of JavaScript. And it might be a professional portfolio with lots of accomplishments, or it could be something really weird and pointless, even better. Ultimately, it is your space to do with whatever you want. And in the early days of the web, there were a lot of sites like this, right? People had sites for their families, they had bands that they liked, or they had kind of personal homepages. The main thing is that it was really fun, and it was a great way to connect with people with similar interests. But it feels like this has been lost somewhere. It feels like we've lost this decades-old art form, the kind of individuality of design and the real uniqueness of content, that experimenting with HTML and CSS just to see what happens, the beauty of a website that's built by a person because they wanted to. So think about the web today, right? Most of us in this room probably get paid to build websites, fine. But a lot of those websites are probably very similar. So they might have, they might be marketing websites, e-commerce, ultimately websites designed to make money, whether that's through selling something or advertising something. And um, it's funny that Hayden mentioned this earlier because I, there are many occasions that I can think of when I've been asked to add tracking pixels to a website or do A-B testing to find out which button converts better or add something to Google Tag Manager. And I die a little bit inside every time I do it. Um, but I have to do it because I get paid. Um, <laughs> but those websites that we build are kind of identical looking, right? Same kind of icons, same kind of hero images, CTAs, illustrations. Even the content is quite similar. So I wrote a blog post for a company I used to work for, and um, it was a good blog post, but I, had to, I was asked to change the title of it to kind of, you know, seven reasons why, etc. And because it converts better, right? It's gonna do better for SEO. And they were, very, they, were, they were exactly right, but it just made me feel like I'd written something for BuzzFeed instead of a company blog. And the sites that we build are, they're offering a service. They are transactional in nature. And these kind of websites have always been there on the internet, but they are the dominant kind of website now. So where did the fun web go? And if you're a newcomer, Building a website is really hard to learn because, you know, I googled how to build a website and this was one of the first results that came up. And this is from Wix, which is a site builder. And this list is ridiculous. Conduct competitor research, explore visual options, define your goal. My goal is to build a website, right? <laughs> and, if you, and if you get into web development now, right, there's intention in that. You're doing it to make a career out of it. And so you might do a boot camp, you might go on a course, do some kind of formal training. But if you do it with a view to doing it professionally, you're, you're much more likely to do what people are hiring for. And so you might jump to whatever framework is hot right now and skip the basics. Um, and I'm not saying don't use frameworks, but it's really important to get that foundational knowledge of HTML and CSS so that you can build accessible websites using semantic HTML elements and not bundling 15 megabytes of JavaScript with every page load. And the websites that we use for fun are also businesses, right? Think about how you use the web today. Chances are it's a set of websites owned by just a few companies. And the web has become really centralized. And in the guise of a free service, these sites are making money from data that they harvest from us. It's no secret, right? They show us personalized advertising, which apparently doesn't work. Um, <laughs> they, they sell our data to third parties, like that's their business model. Of course, they have running costs, websites have running costs, but at the end of the day, they are, exist because they are businesses. 
and they exist for the purpose of making money. And social media is the biggest offender for this. So we write posts, we upload videos, we share images on these centralized platforms, and some of us even conduct business on these platforms. And it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. You know, we are the product. Like, they use our data, they sell it, and that's where their money comes from. And they are beholden to their investors as well, especially if they're not profit-making. And so the focus is on how can we make the most money out of our users. And so ultimately, they aren't really social platforms at their core. They are advertising platforms. And we own the data. Like, the terms of service make it very clear that we own the data that's on there. But they also make it very clear that they can do whatever the hell they want with that data. So they can reproduce it, they can copy it, they can distribute it royalty free. They can and they do make money off us. And we've come a really long way from the days that when we were the creators and we owned our own content. And when it comes to that content, you find yourself moderating yourself and you aim to please your audience, right? Twitter is really addictive. <laughs> And it's about these dopamine hits in, in, in sense of like follows and likes. And you think, what can I post that people are going to respond positively to? And it's the same way that you get the same thumbnail across thousands of YouTube videos or the same variations of tweets being posted over and over. It's about creating content with an with a aim to become viral and then hopefully monetize it and you start preempting the backlash when you post something because there's no room for nuance on the internet, right? So you start thinking, how can someone twist this? Do I need to cover all bases before I post this? I mean, the good news is there's no reply, guys, on your own website. Uh, it's about putting things out on the internet for yourself. And the social, having a social media account is the lowest friction way to having an online presence. And a lot of companies will go to, say, Facebook to get this because it's, it doesn't require any tech knowledge, it doesn't need any money, and you've got a captive audience on these sites as well. But if someone doesn't have an account on that service, they can't see a lot of your page. So I don't, I don't have a Facebook account. And it frustrates me when I look up a restaurant and it just takes me to a Facebook page because I can only see so much before they ask me to log in. So social media, I've complained a lot about social media. And obviously it has had its advantages, right? It's great for staying in touch. A lot of the people in this room I know because of Twitter. And it has really brought me into this community in a way that I don't think I would have done otherwise if I hadn't had a Twitter account. But it comes at the, loss, the, the cost of a lack of creative freedom and my data belonging to someone else's platform. And that content stays on the platform, right? If you break a rule, or God forbid, someone else thinks you break a rule, but you don't actually break a rule, you get banned, you lose access to your content and your account and your audience, and you can't speak to anyone to dispute it. And those interactions on that website aren't transferable not, not easily, anyway. So, you know, if, if we leave Twitter, what do we do with all these tweets? Are they just going to stay there until they stop renewing the domain name? And sometimes sites just die or go down. Like, MySpace very, very famously lost 12 years' worth of data in 2019, just gone. And I was listening to a podcast, like, yesterday about everything that's going on in, in the world of, like, Twitter and social media and... You know, unlike when we all flocked from MySpace to Facebook, apart from Remy, who wasn't on MySpace, um, <laughs> there's, there's no longer a desire for this centralization. We don't want all of our social media and all of our networking and all of our everything to be on one website. So where do we go and what do we do with everything we've written? But first, I want to have a look at what happens. So why are we not building websites for ourselves anymore? You know, it's the same tools. HTML, CSS, no more difficult than it used to be. We can still have free web hosts. We're just not doing it for some reason. And somewhere along the way, the website stopped being about the creators and started being about the consumers. You know, we don't build websites for ourselves like we used to. We build them for the audiences that we want. And it wasn't supposed to be this way, right? So when the World Wide Web was invented, the idea was that it was meant to be decentralized. 
And um, it was actually released intentionally as an open standard to democratize access. And Tim Berners-Lee gave an interview to Vanity Fair in 2018 where he said, it was all based on there being no central authority that you had to go to to ask permission. The spirit there was very decentralized. The individual, the individual was very empowered. That feeling of individual control, that empowerment, is something we've lost. And I see the personal site as an antidote to the centralized web, right? It's, sure, it's hosted on someone else's computer, but it's a piece of web that belongs to you, the creator. And if that host goes down, you just move it somewhere else. And it's not going to fix democracy or topple the giants of online capitalism. But I do think it is a radical act in itself, because it says, I want to carve my own space away from these corporations. And it means not contributing to the enormous fatberg of personal data that underpins the modern web and lines the pockets of a handful of billionaires. I want to talk you through a bit of a history of the personal website on the web and also how it's changed over the years to look to how we got here. And I want to share a bit of my own journey with you as well. Um, I guess I just want to address the privilege of my situation, though, in that I grew up with computers from a very young age, and we had the internet in the house from the mid-90s, and I know that my experience is not universal. But I have seen the World Wide Web change in the last 30 years, and I want to share that with you. So we're going to take a trip through cyberspace back to the early 90s. And ever since the first web page in 1991, people started to build their own sites. And at the very beginning, internet access was pretty much, um, I should say, World Wide Web access was pretty much uh, limited to educational institutions, namely universities. But, um, but ISPs, internet service providers, soon followed, and um, you started to get people making their own sites, like hobbyists, because they offered packages, connection packages with um, simple static hosting as well. So this became available to the general public. And then along came the free web hosts. So you've got GeoCities, uh, Tripod, AngelFire. These offered free web hosting for the masses. And GeoCities in particular is very interesting because it offered this mapping of the real world to a virtual one in the form of neighborhoods. So you had these kind of subdirectories that would host websites of similar topics. And it provided a familiar analogy to what really was a brand new audience to the web. And this sense of small town community in the form of neighborhood link directories was quite a comfort in the otherwise massive and daunting World Wide Web. And they had a drag and drop builder. They even had pre-made layouts, so you didn't even need to learn HTML. But the key thing was that it was free. And so more and more personal sites started to pop up, uh, like family pages like this with lots of photos. Online privacy, interestingly, was less of a concern then because people just, it wasn't easy to find websites. There was a lot of a, a smaller audience as well. People would build websites as collections of graphics that you could download or fan sites for things they loved, check out those frames. And of course, hobby sites for very specific hobbies. Now, at the time, in the late 90s, I was really into a, a game called Pets, which was like a virtual dogs game. I was about eight or nine at this time. Um, sorry to anyone who feels old now. Um, <laughs> but I used to go on this website a lot and download custom breeds and um, lots of um, modded content. But I thought this website was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, and I wanted to learn how to do it myself. Um, and I played a lot with Microsoft front page at school. Um, but it wasn't until I got this book that everything really changed for me. Um, this is Make Your Own Website, a guide for kids. Um, and it taught me how to write my HTML and notepad and build layouts using tables. And absolutely loved it. Started experimenting with that. The amazing news is the entire book is on archive.org um, in all of its glory. I certainly don't write HTML in caps anymore. But while I was just getting to grips with static websites, a whole other kind of web was brewing. And this is a shift from read-only sites to a focus on participation and user-generated content. And of course, this would later become known as Web 2.0. And this is where we see the web starting to become more social, this focus on interactivity, right? What can the user do on the website? And 
we also start to see the shift from creator to consumer focus, right? People start to see the web as a platform to make money from their users. Although the positive of this is that you kind of get these opportunities that you didn't really have before to customize the web that you see. And it actually got people learning some basic web development skills. And one such example of that was Neopets. Um, at secondary school, I certainly spent a lot of time on Neopets. Um, and this was a virtual pet website, but you could customize your shop page, your profile page, your guild page with HTML and CSS. And so I filled mine with auto-playing midis and tiled backgrounds and jazzy pictures. But this was where I really got my start as a web developer, right? I built a GeoCities website for my Neopets guild, and I started making graphics to share. And people were much more likely to join your guild or come to your shop if it looked cool. So this was a real incentive to learn these skills. And even Neopets had guides on how to do it. And there were lots of fan sites with layouts that you could steal and change. And many web, web developers um, that I've spoken to had their first real experience of web development on Neopets. It was this real cultural phenomenon that got people, young people to learn HTML in a way that I haven't really seen since. And as the user-generated web grew, so did the blog. This was my blog in 2002. Um, had its, the, blog, the blog itself was around since the days of static sites, right? People would just write their daily goings on and upload them to their server. Um, but this is where we start to see blogging software emerge, right? So we've got B2, Grey Matter. This one was Grey Matter. Movable Type, and later, of course, WordPress. And then you also have some hosted blogging platforms like LiveJournal, Blogger, Open Diary. My friends and I all had, um, all had blogs like this, full of links and personality quizzes. Um, and of course, they were all built with frames. And as I grew older, I kind of fell into this community of personal site creators, where domain names were this kind of status symbol. And you'd have these very over-the-top domains like lovexguns.org or definitemaybe.org and .net and all sorts. And I was never cool enough or allowed enough to have a domain name. Um, but it was, if, you, if you had a domain name, you'd host other people, and it was a real privilege to be a hostee on someone's really cool domain name. But there was a real emphasis on community in this space on the internet, and this, this emphasis on helping others learn HTML. And we'd all make friends and comment on each other's blogs and uh, link to our friends' sites of people that we'd never even met. And the real vibe of these websites was, this is my space on the internet, but here's something for you. So you'd usually have a page of things for the visitor, like graphics or Photoshop brushes or HTML snippets to use on your own site, which I think is really special. And a lot of these websites were run by women and girls. It was this real safe space on the internet for marginalized people, where we could be ourselves or adopt aliases if you wanted. There were no real name policies. And the like-minded audience that you had was very small and controlled as well, so it felt safe. And this particular site belongs to someone called Rachel White, who's on Twitter as at Oho. And she gave a talk at JSConf EU in 2017 called Keep the Internet Weird, which is all about this period of the internet. And I think it is a fantastic talk, so I recommend checking that out. And then social media got big all of a sudden, and everything really changed. And social media has been around in various forms since the late 90s, right? So you've got Live Journal and Blogger, but also Friendster, Friends Reunited, things like this. Websites where you make friends and you chat to each other or post content for your friends to see. But it was MySpace that really set the world on fire. And it was launched in 2003. And by 2004, it had 5 million users. And I think this one particularly blew up because it's at a time when internet access was becoming much more widespread in homes, but also it surged in popularity with young people because this was a product that merged socializing with music, which is two things that young people obviously love. And I used to be a nerd for making websites. Um, people at my school didn't really have the internet at home or they didn't use the internet very much. So um, it was weird for me, because suddenly MySpace made it really cool to have an online presence. And it was even cooler if you could make it look good with CSS. And when I tell people what I do for a living now, 
Sometimes they tell me they remember using CSS to make their MySpace page look cool. Um, it's like a bit like Neopets all over again, but on a much larger scale. And no one seems to remember what they did. <laughs> but on the other hand, there's no longer a need to have your own website anymore because everything's just there on MySpace. Your About Me page becomes a profile page. Your blog posts become bulletins and status updates. And your links pages become a friends list or a top eight. And we start to see this centralization starting to take place as everyone flocked to MySpace. And then, no sooner had they flocked to MySpace, they all left for Facebook. Um, and Facebook didn't allow customization at all. Every page just looked like Facebook. And I used to really enjoy Facebook. I was on it a lot. I'd interact with offline, real-life friends in new ways that I hadn't before. You know, we'd upload dumps of photos from nights out and comment on them with in-jokes. And when I went to university, it was a real lifeline for joining groups. And there was that weird period of time where if you weren't on Facebook, you didn't get invited to any events. But as Facebook got bigger and Twitter as well, people just stopped engaging with blogs so much. And by 2010, I just wasn't building websites for fun anymore. I would build these massively over-engineered WordPress websites for university societies. And I had a live journal for a while, and I gave up with that as well, because it just seemed like there was no point having a blog anymore. You know, everything was on Facebook, and then it was on Twitter, and then it was on Instagram. And I didn't know anyone who still had a personal website. And we also see the rise of the internet on the mobile phone at this point, um, when the iPhone came out in 2008, and then people started to get smartphones and started to access the internet that way. And as a hobbyist, it added a lot of complexity because I didn't really know how to build sites that look good on, on a phone. And the blogs that there were went from being people's musings or daily goings on to being targeted towards a specific audience. And this is where we start to see Blogger becoming an occupation. And popular blogs become stuffed full of ads and sponsored content. And that is, there's that real shift from doing it for the sake of doing it to doing it to make a living. And what once was for the writer's own benefit now becomes focused on the people who read it. I was really into makeup at the time. And I wanted to become a makeup blogger in the hopes that I would get a load of PR samples for free, which I didn't because I was very lazy. But also, I... It was, for me, it was a real example of a blog that was focused on the reader, not the writer, because I didn't get any joy out of posting. It was a real slog. I had to take all these pictures of makeup and products and put them on the site and edit the photos and make sure the titles were SEO'd enough and so that I'd get some hits, and I rarely did. And then in 2014, I started a food blog called Quiche Me Quick. Um, <laughs> And it lasted maybe six months before I got bored of that as well, because at the as, a, as a creator, the internet for me had become about engagement. And if I wasn't getting any engagement on these websites, what was the point? And I would never be able to compete with the lifestyle bloggers with their fancy DSLR setups. And it just seemed to me that if I couldn't make a website look like a glossy magazine, there was absolutely no point having one. So at this point, if you're building a website, you probably needed to sell something or you wanted to get something. And you'd likely use a WordPress site with a pre-made theme. Or you might use the hot new web framework Bootstrap, which made mobile-friendly websites really easy and then had the side effect of making all the websites ever look exactly the same. And then we get website builders like Squarespace sponsoring literally every single podcast. Um, which, you know, had brought back the GeoCities drag-and-drop builder days, but in a way, way that is much more expensive. Um, and if you needed a website for your business, you just make a Squarespace. Again, a lot of very, very similar-looking websites here. But, you know, they weren't designed for personal websites unless you wanted to monetize them somehow. And I wonder if I hadn't become a web developer and fallen in with a crowd of cool people who had their own website, whether I would ever have made a website again. Um, which makes me really sad. And I want to change that. And I know I'm not the only one. So I'm going to show you some people who are bringing back the magic of the personal website. Um, and some of them are actually in this room, and I haven't told them, so sorry. Um, I'm going to just give you a motion warning. There's some videos of me interacting with some websites. This is Cassie's website. Some of you know Cassie. 
um, and she has incredible SVG skills. She's an SVG animation whiz. Um, lots of fun effects as you move the mouse, but also a lovely dark and light mode. Her website is cassie.codes. This is Sadness's website. Um, again, a pseudonym, but real 90s, noughties vibes from this site. Lots of content for the visitor to use on their own website, like HTML tutorials and button, make, button makers, um, and also a, a page of shrines, the things that she loves. Real um, author-focused uh, author content as well, which I really love. This is Lynn Fisher's website. She's a graphic designer, and incredible things happen when you resize the page. I have no idea how she did this. Um, this is a really awkwardly long video, but it's worth it. Just so good. <laughs> and this is Alistair Shepard's website. Um, it's inspired by the video game Firewatch. And the color changes depending on the time of day, which is absolutely wonderful. He did a great talk at State of the Browser this year about how he built it, so I had to put this one in as well. This is David Danza's website. Um, very minimalist compared to the ones we've just seen. Um, but I think it shows you don't have to do a massively overcomplicated website to have a cool website. Um, and got a little loudspeaker icon next to his name, and if you click it, something really silly happens. I'm not going to spoil that. This is Kara's website. Kara has a lovely minimalist design that scales, that resizes really naturally with the browser because she's used CSS Grid. Ooh. Um, but also, minimalist doesn't have to mean a white background as well. There's a lovely pink and purple gradient. This is my colleague Carol's website. Um, beautifully minimalist and lovely colors, but I chose this one especially because she's got a whole page dedicated to her keyboards and tech setup, which inspired me to do my own keyboard fan page. Um, but just, that was something that I really miss of the days of like the noughties web, is that you just put whatever the hell you wanted on your website, right? I like keyboards, here's a page of my keyboards. What could be better? There's also lots of movements out there dedicated to bringing back the glory of the personal website. IndieWeb is um, a movement that calls itself a people-focused antidote to the corporate web. Um, and it's all about owning your own data, about syndicating your content across multiple platforms, and posting basically whatever you want, however you want. And they have a concept of what they call posse, which is publish on your own site, syndicate everywhere. Um, and it's about using tools and scripts to link to, to repost or link to your content on other platforms. And the point of this is that existing audiences can still see your content. So if you've got a Twitter following, they can still see what you're posting on your blog. Um, and they say, let your friends read your posts their way. And I have the kind of opposite thing set up. So on my own site, I have uh, web mentions set up. So um, these are a protocol where if a website has web mentions enabled, whenever they blog or post about your website or a page on your website, then you get notified. And then every time I build my site, all of those notifications are collected and displayed underneath the page. The idea of permanence is really important to the indie web. They believe that links should stay the same. And on the one hand, I totally get it. But on the other hand, it does require a domain name. Um, that you can keep consistent over multiple years. And this is obviously not possible for everyone because there is an expense associated with that. But I think there is plenty that we can take from this movement, especially around owning your own content and being in control of where and how it's posted. Another movement focuses more on how things used to be, and this is called the Yesterweb movement. And this takes a really hard line stance, and it says, the internet of today is fundamentally broken. And there's a real heavy dose of nostalgia in its members' websites. The um, mastermind behind the Yesterweb is Sadness, whose website I just showed you. Um, but there's a lot of manifestos on the Yesterweb website about um, what's wrong with the web in its current form. But this, ma this movement has a huge emphasis on building websites as a creative hobby. And I absolutely love that, because that's how it started for me. And I find that I don't have a lot of time for that these days because I spend all day building websites f for, for money. They've got a community Discord, and they've also got a web ring for their members' websites. 
um, but they are quite pres uh, prescriptive about what kind of websites can be on it. So no professional portfolios, for example, which is a shame because technically my website is a professional portfolio. I'm not at all bitter. And I'm obviously very nostalgic for the old web. I have a lot of fond memories of growing up on it, but I think there is room for both the web of today and the old web to coexist. You know, websites don't need to look like GeoCities to be good websites. I think we should rather take the principles of those days, namely that anything goes, and apply it to the sites that we're making today. And we know a hell of a lot more today about things like accessibility and web performance than we did back then as well. And I'll say it again, like in this world of websites for profit and not fun, building your own website is a radical thing to do. You know, your space on the internet. And you don't need to ditch social media or stop building websites for business, but these things can live happily alongside each other as well. And my website was originally like a blog and a talk portfolio, but I wanted to be a bit more experimental and fun with it. So I built six themes with a theme switcher. I was in between jobs at the time. Um, but um, one of these layouts harks back to the days of GeoCities. Um, and I, but I really wanted to be accessible as well, so it works totally normally without JavaScript. Um, and also, if you have reduced motion settings enabled, then the, the GIFs don't animate. Um, because I think you can and you should have a creator-focused website that also is still considerate towards the people who are using it. Now, I don't want to be prescriptive about what you do with your website. It, you know, it's your space. Um, it might be a maximalist extravaganza, or it could be white tech, oh, black text on a white background. You might spend hours handwriting the HTML, or you might use a drag-and-drop generator. You might host it on someone else's platform or on a, off a box in your bedroom. All of these things are valid as long as you build it for yourself. And you, you don't need to think about SEO or design trends unless you want to. You might want to list recipes that you like or start a blog, write about tech or share pictures of dogs. Just do whatever, do whatever you want. You could build something completely pointless. And this is my favorite genre of, in, of website in the whole world, is the useless web. Websites that have one joke, and you put it on the website, for, on the web, for people to get joy from. We need more of this. Your space is an opportunity to be as weird as you want, to experiment and to learn. You can use whatever web APIs you want. Browse MDN and find the weirdest sounding API, and just experiment and see what it does and use new features of CSS without wondering whether your customers' uh, web, um, customers browsers are going to support it. You know, use the P3 color space that only works in Safari. Try out the things behind experimental flags just to see what happens. And you know, if you screw it up, you can just roll your site back. Experiment in production, write bad code, ship it, see what happens. You know, if, if, if I mess up my website, it deploys in like 20 seconds, so I can just revert it and no one will ever notice. A good personal website shouldn't take itself too seriously. And if you build the basics of your site in normal HTML, that content will show up regardless of the fancy stuff. So that's known as progressive enhancement. And the basics of your content will be there for everyone to see. And then the weird stuff will be there for you and anyone else who has Chrome Canary. <laughs> and the tools are still the same as they ever were, right? So HTML, CSS. And it is still completely and totally possible to write some HTML, put it on a server, and have a static web page. You don't need to get bogged down in frameworks and build tools, and that's so easy these days. But you don't need React or Webpack or whatever pack we're talking about now. I mean, you can use it if you want, but it's not a must-have or a must-learn for having your own website. And resist the temptation to send people to the latest, greatest framework if they just want a single website, right? Learning HTML might put someone on the path to becoming a web developer, or they might just have a website that they update occasionally and that's it, and that's fine. You know, neither outcome is better or worse than the other. Just start with the simplest possible tutorials and tips. And hosting doesn't have to cost you anything. Storage is so cheap now that free hosting is better than it's ever been. And this is NeoCities, which is a free open source static site host that's aimed at anyone who wants to make a website. They've got an HTML tutorial, and a lot of the sites on NeoCities are very nostalgic and evoke that kind of feeling of the late 90s and early 2000s. 
and there's a really nice community vibe there as well. And I, they have a quote on their website I really love. It's time we took back our personalities from these sterilized, lifeless, monetized, data-mined, monitored addiction machines and let our creativity flourish again. There's a website called personalsit.es, <laughs> personal sites, which is a directory of personal websites. And um, it's great for inspiration if you just want to get started, but also you can get your own site listed by PRing it as well on GitHub. And I hope this has shown you that the personal site is not dead, right? It just got forgotten about in the commercialized web of today. And we owe it to ourselves to rediscover this somewhat lost art. You know, we can still be creators just for the sake of creating, and we can still post content without someone else making money from it. So what are we waiting for? So once more, build your own website. Make it fun, make it pointless, but most importantly of all, make it yours. Thank you very much.